Welcome to Comics TV, we're your weekly guide to the comic book universe. I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Steve Prisbella. Each week, America's favorite comic book show highlights the best books, interviews, and news. So let's kick off today's show with the mainstream reviews. And Steve, why thank you. For my first book on Mainstream Review this week, The Disney Afternoon, featuring Darkwing Duck, number five, sells for $1.50 from Marvel Comics. It's written by Paul S. Newman, art is done by Bill Fugate, and inks are done by Glenn Hay. Darkwing Duck and his band of characters, including Honker and Launchpad, take on a group of bank robbers to foil their plans to rob the banks and museums. With the magnetic menace, a magnet that throws all metal out of whack. The story of this one is cute, written and drawn for everybody to enjoy over and over again. Pick this one up if you can. It's six cents on the price index, and that's pretty cheap for a book, so pick it up. For my second book, Black Lightning, brought back from the late 70s for an all new series, The Dollar 95 from DC. Presenting part one of an educational triology from DC. Mr. Pierce, a teacher, is trying to stop gang wars in his school. And the gang wars are getting worse in the streets with criminals like Painkiller. He has a hard time just controlling himself and the gangs. It was a great story and I must say it was very well written. A very, very educational book. I liked it. Get it. This one was eight cents on the price index, which is still cheap for a book. For my third book this week on a mainstream review, I'm going with Batman Might Fall from DC Comics. It sells for $4.95. The story is from Alan Grant, the artwork is from Kevin O'Neill, and color is by Digital Chameleon. This story has the same storyline as the Nightfall series from Batman, but with a twist to it. Most of it has the same characters, but with different names, like Bane Might and Bat Might. Most of the DC Universe is also in this book. All four Superman and Supergirl show up. It's an entertaining story, but definitely not on my top list of buys. This is drawn with the same comedy as Mad Magazine and DC combined. It was not worth it, so think twice about buying this one. This one was 11 cents a page, and that's a lot of money for a, gra like a graphic novel comic book. So. Seriously, think about it. And that one is the end of my mainstream review. Top in this week's comics news. Look out, Marvel junkies. Fleer is releasing what promises to be one of the best looking card series of 1995, Marvel Metal. Debuting brand new technology, this takes trading cards to a new level. And to top that, it will deliver at a price 40 to 60% lower than Fleer's Flare or Top's Finest, making this a set you might even be able to afford. Fleer created a unique process to create these great looking cards. First, original artwork is penciled by top Marvel artists. Then computer generated images are created from the pencils. Then a 3D prismatic foil is engraved to make every computer generated image jump off the card and finally the whole thing is laminated. Did you ask about subsets? Well of course there are subsets. What card series wouldn't have them? Three all foil to be exact. The silver flasher contains 137 cards. They are mirror images of the 137 regular cards and one is in every pack. There are also 18 metal blasters, one in every two packs 
and the 18 gold blasters, which are gold versions of the metal blasters, one in every three packs. They look nice and the price might be right, but how many Marvel cards do we really want? That is the question. Techno Comics announced on January 13th that comic book legend Frank Miller will provide pencils and inks for the cover of the first issue of Techno's Mickey Spillane's Mike Danger comic book. Miller is best known for his work on Daredevil, Batman, The Dark Knight Returns, and most recently on Sin City. In December 1994, Hero Illustrated, Miller acknowledged that Spillane referenced in his Sin City books. He said that Spillane is my favorite writer and he's bound to have a big effect on how I approach this stuff. Mickey Spillane's Mike Danger is set in the year 2052. New York City is now known as New Two. Crime is virtually unknown and citizens have been willing to pay the price for progress until Mike Danger is released from a hibernation chamber. He has been in since 1950. New Two is going through a 1950s fashion revival and Danger is a living icon of the time. I'm willing to conform to the new age. Everything is beautiful mindset. Danger begins investigating New Two and finds all is not as it seems. And he is not only person awakened after 100 years. Coming in May 1995, this looks like it could be a winner out of Techno Comics. The next story is a little out of the ordinary for comics TV, but comics are comics, and this is one that looks good. Michael Oslan and Greg and Tim Hildebrandt team up to recreate Terry and the Pirates, one of the greatest American adventure strips. The 1995 Terry and the Pirates will feature many of the characters and concepts of creator Milton Caniff, but with a 90s look and feel. Terry Lee and Pat Ryan team up once again to travel Europe, Asia, and Africa, setting their sights on gun runners, tanker hijackers, software thieves, computer chip counterfeiters, and other contemporary pirates. Michael A. Silver, VP and Editorial and Development at uh, Tribune Media Services, said that in recent years, newspapers have been cutting back on the space devoted to serial strips or have stuck with gag-a-day humor strips or stale adventure strips. They hope to change all this beginning in March. At least a half dozen newspapers have picked up the new Terry and the Pirates, including the New York Daily News and Ch Chicago Tribune. And they had one of the coolest media packages I've seen in a while. In the mid-1930s, before the mask and cape Avengers of evil were popular, a secretive shrouded superhero appeared on the comic page. The Phantom was born, ushering in the trend of brooding, mysterious superheroes that endure to this day. His popularity also continues. He now appears in more than 500 newspapers around the world and has a new Marvel comic series. To celebrate the re resurgence of this fame, Comic Images will be releasing Phantom Collector Cards. The Phantom was created by Lee Falk. It's an action-packed adventure strip. His mystical powers are contained in two rings he wears. On Mark's Friends of the Phantom. And the other brands, evildoers with a deadly skull imprint. But unlike the other comic strip heroes, the Phantom's powers are transferable from generation to generation. And 17 individuals have taken on the Oath of the Skull. The 90 card set will feature classic art by creator Lee Falk and hot new Marvel art. The full color card backs will feature the Phantom chronological and trivia. The chase cards will include chromium and medallion cards, rare art cards, and a 24 karat gold signature card by creator Falk. Coming in mid-April, the cost will be 79 cents to 99 cents per 10 card pack. And that's it for Comics News this week. This is the Independent Review. Since the start of Comics TV, we've reviewed over 200 independent titles. My first book today is Family Man number one from DC's Paradox Press. Jerome Sharon is the writer and Joe Staten is the artist. New York 1999. Things are a lot tougher than they used to be. 
the mafia is no longer powerful, and the once powerful dons cower in fear as a mysterious killer hunts them down one by one. Only one man, still loyal to his former don, is left to find the killer. Alonzo is the family man. To make matters worse, his brother the Monsignor and a friend of the police keeps an eye on his brother. Writer Charon has authored over 20 books, and Joe Stanton has worked on many of the Marvel and DC titles. This is a great story, has great art, it's uh, in black and white, shipping February 21st. Keep an eye out, and lastly, this is not for kids. Next today is a book I picked up from a Canadian duo. Arcana number one is by T.S. Wells and Rob Clark. Wells and Clark is their company, and it's a very interesting tale, much in the Cerebus Hepcat style. Arcana is an anthropomorphic story involving animals with human characteristics. There are 67 pages in this initial issue, making it a whopper, and at $3, it's only four cents on the price index. What a deal! They must be just breaking even. The story involves Flag and Foxglove, a con, uh, con team who meet up with a young girl with a troubled past. The art is pretty good, not quite up to the prose as is seen in some of the facial expressions and the features. Overall though, the art quality is acceptable. The story is long and it gets somewhat detailed. If you enjoy Cerebus or Hepcats, you may find this story to your liking. I give it a recommendation. As always, if your local store doesn't have it, write to us and we'll put you in touch. My next title might be a little too graphic for some of our viewers. Phantom Force number 8, a former image title now from Genesis West. Michael Thibodeau is the writer from a plot by the late Jack Kirby. Thibodeau also penciled and co-inked with Martin Lassick. The cost is $2.50. Kirby Thibodeau and Richard French created Phantom Force. This is what every red-blooded teenage boy wants. Good art, good story, action, fun, and very good-looking characters. The blood is red, not some pseudo-blood color. Top quality art and great color make this very image-looking. But, like image, there are also quite a few splash pages. The main story is 26 pages long, making this book a nine cents on the price index. Aliens, a superhero team, decent story, excellent art with a very Kirby-esque look to it and a feel to it. It's also uh, Phantom Force Pogs are involved if you want to get your hands on those. $2.95 for those, but I would save your cash and pick up just the book. Next, my last book is Triple X number one of seven from Dark Horse. Arnold and Jacob Pander do the works. It's $3.95. Set in Amsterdam in the year 2033, the world is a much different place than now. Multinational corporations control much of the political boundaries. And one of these people, Thexal, aspires to own it all. There is a resistance movement attempting to stop the multinats. They're rioting, assassinating, and more. Hans, an American, has come to take some time off only to get caught up in it all. The Pander brothers have created a tale that combines politics, sci-fi, good plot to make Triple X a top-notch book. Definitely not for everyone though. With an interesting art style, this is a book that plays out like a movie. It's eight cents on the price index. I hope it gets better in the coming months because it's definitely recommended. And that's it for the main, main independent reviews this week. <laughs> and it's time for our interview summary of the show. This week we're interviewing Richard Pace. He's done some work for Malibu Comics, some Marvel Comics. We met him up in Toronto a few months back. So, let's go take a look. Okay, how did you get your start in comics? In terms of interest or drawing them professional? Uh, starting with interest and then drawing professional. Well, I was in high school studying commercial art as a major in high school. And I said, well, geez, what am I going to do it's to make a living? And I was at a pharmacy and I saw a rack of comics and said, I could do that. And that's how I got interested in it. And after several years, I realized it's a lot harder than just wanting to do it. Um, so I went to college, studied illustration. Got a firm foundation in drawing, perspective, and also read several good books on comics, understanding comics by Will Eisner being the best. 
and just just did page after page of samples, sent them in, and eventually I got my first job. Mm. Who was your major influence in the comic book industry? In comics, it's really hard because I like a lot of people in comics, but my major influences come from outside of comics. And who would that be? Uh, John Singer Sargent, great portrait painter from the early part of the century. N.C. Wyeth, fabulous book illustrator. Uh, several other artists that you guys probably just don't know about. <laughs> um, do you read comics? Yes. What What's your favorite? My favorite? Ooh, it's a toss-up between Cerebus and Sandman. Ooh. Um, what do you think it takes to be a popular creator? Popular creator. Well, two things can happen, and generally this is the way it does happen. Uh, you get on a hot book, and therefore you become a hot artist on a hot book, and you get heat from that or attention from that, or you're drawing a book that becomes hot. And because you apparently made the book hot, that's how you become popular. Generally, I really think popular creators happen as a team effort. A good writer, a good artist, good colorist, good inker, becomes a good book. That's how people become hot. What did you do before you broke into comics? A lot of illustration, a couple of part-time jobs, mail dancer, Chippendales. <laughs> I've let myself slide. <laughs> Still got my cuffs though. <laughs> do you think it's tougher to break into the industry now or years ago? Now. No? Then why is that? Well, years ago, basically all you had to do is be able to tell a story well. And there was a lot of smaller companies that just needed people who could tell stories. Now, not only do you have to be able to tell a story, you have to look hot, you have to be more professional now, starting, than you had to be 10 years ago. Um, do you believe there's any sexual or racism in the comic book industry right now? There is sexism and racism in every form of media there is. It's no, more, no worse or less than any other media. Uh, especially concerning that it's a male-dominated media. We are, we are being entrenched with political correctness. Uh, editors are saying, no, you can't draw this because the woman's too sexy. Um, but on the other hand, we get comic books out there that are just purely about sex, mm -hmm. just like any other media. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. I'll tell you something, Clay. What is it, Morgan? I'm better than you. I've always been better. <laughs> I can beat you, Clay. Now you hit it. And you better hit it fast. I won, Clay. I won. This week, I do a review. Hate number 16 from Fantagraphics Comics. Peter Bagg is the writer. Steve claims it's $2.95. Yes. This is Bagg's first venture into coloring hate, and I believe it looks fantastic. The first page you open to looks like it could be right out of an animated feature. Longtime fans have argued that coloring would detract from the original idea. I think it looks great. I think it looks great, too. I really liked it. The artwork was done fabulous. The story was funny as could be. Uh, it deals with him and his girlfriend are going back to his town, to his mother's, to visit his mother and see his father in the hospital. And it was really funny. I, there was uh, one segment in the book where he went to a, a fraternity party that they didn't know anybody at. And it turns out he's seen his one friend he knew and they went up on a roof and they were watching guys do blue flamers and <laughs> he fell off the roof. It, it was a really funny book. Really. Yeah. Yeah, hate, hate, from back in 1993 when we first started, I reviewed Hate. And back then I said hate is great and hate is great. I think the color makes it look even better. Yeah, uh, the upgrading from being a black and white book to color book took nothing away from it. If anything, it added on to the value and the way this book looks. Right. If it continues to be this good, uh, hate will definitely see an increase in the number of readers. Oh, no doubt. And I think this is a prime candidate for an animated feature, a real one. Uh, definitely, this is something this could be made into a cartoon for Saturday afternoons. Well, or actually something that could be on MTV, right? Uh, like MTV oddities, right? <laughs> I, I can actually see this 
Hate is an adult-oriented comic, and I can actually see this being uh, an adult, even a full-length feature. Yeah. Much like the, the Japanese do their full lengths, and this is in that type because it's uh, definitely geared towards adults. Because there is, you know, there's a little nudity and there's some swearing and stuff, and it, the, the story's not written for kids. No. But I, I'll tell you what, if it would go on MTV, it would definitely give Beavis and Butthead a run for the money. Definitely. That, yeah, that would be. It'd be a good because hate is, hate is really good, and um, hate has a lot of dry humor in it too. That's yeah, what I like. Yeah, it, it's a, this was a typical hate story. Yeah, you know, just like all the other ones, but uh, the color definitely made an improvement. The, the art was great. Um, this is one of my favorite books. I like it. I gotta admit, I like it for an independent title. I really like this a lot too. Yeah, it's just it's a good, funny book. It's yeah. something you can sit down, you read it, you enjoy it, you laugh out loud, and you can read it again a couple days later and laugh again at the same spots. It's really, it's really yeah. good. I was really impressed when I flipped open that first page and the, the color. I mean, it looked like it you popped right out. Yeah, of yeah the it animation stood right style. up. Yeah, it, it stood like right animation. up, caught your eye. Pick this one up, definitely. Yeah, definitely recommend it. Yeah. And that's it. I do a review this week. I've got a quick 30 second mini comic review. It's called 4013970. It's by Stephen Gilbert. It's a 24 hour comic. What that means is in 24 hours, he wrote, drew, inked, and completed a whole book. It was not, basically almost a non stop thing. A lot of people do this in the small press. And it's a weird kind of story. I don't know what you can compare it to, but it's definitely independent in real, in um, story content and type. It's interesting. Take a look for those 24-hour comics in the mini bins. Was he tired when he did the last page of this book? I don't know. <laughs> it looks like the artwork went down the tubes towards the end of the book. It's not bad. And he's got a bunch more. I'll give you some more in the next few weeks. And that's it for the 30-second mini comic review today. Thanks for watching Comics TV this week. This is the end. We hope you enjoyed today's show. As always, we say, if you enjoyed it or if you didn't enjoy it, there's some, some reason why. Write to us, email us, something. Let us know, and we will try and accommodate you. Yeah, and like I say every week, when you go into that comic store to pick up that book that we reviewed this week on our show, tell them you've seen it on Comics TV. Hi, Steve from Comics TV, and we're here in Toronto at Toronto's Comic Book Extravaganza. We're here with Jason Armstrong from DC Comics, and uh, Jason, how are you doing today? Doing good. Um, i got a couple questions to ask you. How did you get your start in the comic industry? Well, um, I started sending samples into DC and Marvel, and I got a lot of response from DC and absolutely nothing from Marvel. <laughs> and after waiting on tables for a year and a half, I quit my job and went to Manhattan and showed my portfolio around and I got a job. Um, what type of comic related uh, training did you have to, to get going in the industry? Um, well, I went to three years of illustration school and after I realized that I had not, absolutely nothing to do with illustration school, I, <laughs> I just went back and just worked on a lot of anatomy and a lot of storytelling and uh, went to Manhattan. Cool. What are you currently working on right now? Right now I'm working on the Robin Annual for 95. I just got the, uh, the script yesterday oh, wow. and I'm really excited. Cool. Cool. Um, do you read any comics? I read everything. 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 Any any specific hot titles that's your favorite? Um, I really I really like a lot of what uh, Steve Rude's doing with Nexus and a lot of pretty much a lot of everybody. I like what Michael Ringo's doing with uh, was doing with the Flash. Uh, I'm anxious to see what uh, Carlos Pancheco's doing with Bishop. Everything. That Bishop's a good story. I like that. I just picked that one up. Um, can you earn a decent living in, in this industry? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got the evil eye over here, huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm starting to have to put money in the bank, and I'm starting to have to talk to accountants and things. <laughs> What's your greatest accomplish accomplishment right now in, in what you've done? Right now? Yeah. Um, I'd have to say... Just being confident enough to be able to, to pick and choose, start be able to start and pick and choose my projects. When I first started, I took everything that came my way, and now I'm starting to, to be oh, getting choosy on get, what you want yeah, to do. Well, choosy. Um, I, I I'm just, I'm making decisions as to what's going to be a good career decision and what isn't. Was it hard being a Canadian to break into American industry of well, comics? Yeah, because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that I that 
the comic book companies were asking me to do, I was doing over the border and it was costing me twice as much to do. And what I eventually did was find myself an agent. Oh, cool. In California. Oh, in California. In California. Hey. Okay. Um, do you think there's any racial racism or sexism in the comic book industry? Yeah, I uh, I was drawing a comic for uh, a nameless company, and uh, and I eventually decided to leave because I was drawing a woman in a bikini, and I had a tough time explaining to my mom what it was I was doing, <laughs> and I had a tough time explaining to my girlfriend, and and it just was was a little difficult, and I had to step up, step back from it and look at it and go, this isn't what I want to do. Hmm. Okay. Um, what do you think? about the current state of the whole industry itself. How do I answer that without stepping on toes and burning bridges? Um, oh. Yeah. I, uh, very carefully? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think a, I think a lot of storytelling is being lost and it's being, which is really horrible because I'm, I'm supposed to be defending artists, but uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of books are... Hey, gotta say it as it is. A lot of books are, are being sold base, basically because the way they look, not because they're, not because they're well written. Not because there's any sort of any sort of story content. Yeah. It's it's frustrating, and it's good for me, but it's bad for the readership on whole. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Really appreciate it for taking time out with us. Okay. And, uh...